So welcome to Challenge the Road, first podcast, We've got our special guest. We've been out in the DBR1, set a lap time to Simon Reynolds, head driver performance manager at McLaren, 14 years. Absolutely. Yep. 14 years um, from 2006 to 2000, uh, end of 2019. Nine Formula One drivers you've trained. So <laughs> I supported nine Formula One drivers at race or test events. Um, I travel with uh, Heike Kovalainen in 2008. Um, I was a driver performance manager there um, for a number of years, um, supporting young drivers such as Stoffel Van Dorn, Kevin Magnussen from uh, entry level single seater all the way through to Formula One. And 16 championships, McLaren won during that time. <laughs> well, I helped facilitate 16 championships from karting through to uh, up to Formula One. So f two Formula, two, uh, two championship wins, um, which was amazing. Um, and what was that build? Because I, I went up before, obviously you had the, the app from us for the McLaren Young Drivers. But what was it like going to that building every day? Because, I mean, I went there and it was like... A, you know, you, we, you sort of went down the stairs, then we went up the lift. It was clinical, obviously all very white, very clean. But what was it like for you every day going there? It's an amazing place. I mean, when I first saw the building, let alone enter the building, it's just like something from another planet. And then when you walk in, you get these white corridors you have to walk through, um, which is like some James Bond movie set. And then you get into this lift that takes you up to the sort of boulevard area where all the... And you have that lovely are. view of the cars. I mean, I got lost in there once. Yes. I, 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 well, I thought I was going to the toilets and went through a door because you just use your hand as a swipe. <clears> and I went into sort of a meeting area with a model car and I couldn't get back out because <laughs> there's no door handles. It's just, you have to go and you have to find. Yeah. And, and I'm just rubbing the wall like this, trying to get out. Yeah, it just it's just a stunning building. It's set in it's set in Halls of Common, which was famous um, for for the book that was written about uh, the aliens landing. Right. So War of the Worlds, probably heard of that. And uh, it's set in in an old farm er sort of area, and uh, it's been developed over a number of years. But the actual building is like a yin yang shape. Right. Ron's sort of vision for McLaren um, to create this building where. People were just in awe of it when the, when they walked in. It is stunning when you walk through and you've got the F1 cars and Ayrton Senna's and Hamilton's. It is, and you amazing. can see the race bays and the test bays and the test yeah, bays. Yeah, you can they, see them working the while cars, you're there. Yeah. yeah, Neil Trundle, who was a good friend of mine, um, he retired uh, last year. He was there for, uh, well, from the beginning. So when it was Rondell Racing. And uh, he, he literally stayed as the chief mechanic all the way through. So he was he worked with Ayrton Senna and uh, he saw some incredible, he's got some incredible stories. Um, and how was Ron Dennis in that? Because he's one of my heroes. I, I'd love to meet Ron Dennis one day, but how was he as a, a boss for you or did you see him much? Or Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he was my hero and is my hero um, to this day. Just an incredible person who would make a room go silent um just by him just walking through it um he his vision his passion is just astounding and his uh, attention to detail was second to none wasn't it across anything he was doing absolutely impeccable yeah and you know you you see that when you when you go to mclaren uh and it still has that incredible cleanliness and all inspiring so I remember about place. the tiles on the floor, they had to not have a gap at the end, was it? Or And it took ages to do that, you know, to make it as he wanted. So I think they adapted the size of the building so the tile didn't have a cut at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff like that. You yeah, know, just, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And it, and it was designed for people, to, you know, sponsors and um, people connected with McLaren to visit and just have an incredible experience. And that's exactly what... They, they they got um you know they get a, a vip around a sort of tour around the lake yeah. as it were arrive and then i've done that with it. mclaren you do, yeah, is, yeah and, I, and i went in there and, and you go sort of round past the cafe then you got all the trophy cabinets that's right then you go round then you go in and then you see cars yeah around it's the it's just amazing it's just an incredible place and i was <laughs> i was fortunate to be the only person to actually um together with fernando and uh lando uh, to go on the lake 
So I was right, the, okay. I was Fernando's body double for an advert. Okay. And uh I I was the stunt double for uh the stand up paddleboarding. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> now did that go? Oh uh, yeah, really well. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. So it was uh they edited it together and um you couldn't really tell it was it was me. Um so if you look closely at the end when I'm sort of jumping up, um you can sort of we we'll have to try and get some clips of that yeah. somewhere <laughs> yeah. find that. So we have, you know, the the setup for today, mm. we've got some car news I want to go through. There's some really interesting topics that have been going on. Then you've been out in the DBR1, wow. which I know we've been talking about in the week and yes. how special that is and how you know we managed to get that car and what we're going to do at Goodwood this year with the marquee, which you'll be there. And then moving on to your lap time. Oh, gosh. Which I'm sure a lot of drivers will be wanting to see at some point, but I know <laughs> I couldn't get you off that. <laughs> so we'll we go back to that at the end and, yeah. and share your lap time and some of your driving on there. But the first one in the last couple of weeks, I saw an article from Autocar mm-hmm. about McLaren 12C mm. and M3 CSL. And, and it really interested me about values of cars because obviously my sort of background is buying non-depreciating cars and hoping they appreciate or stay the same and really enjoy the drive of them. So this was really interesting because you would have been there when the McLaren 12C would have been built, which was the first sort of, not the first carbon tub, but a road manufactured tub for a road going car and mass produced was very rare. And these cars, I think were about 265 270 thousand pounds in 2011 and now we're talking under 70 thousand pounds um, and we were discussing how is this happening and then this article come out about an m3 csl and we were chatting off air about which one you would have um so you you went with an m3 csl didn't you i did um Purely because I I love I love the kind of um, dare I say it the boy racer kind of cars around naturally ra- aspirated engines nas- yeah, yeah absolutely and- yep and don't get me wrong the McLaren is is mm. is, is lovely to I was surprised yeah I, I I thought you would but I I do know that CSL is a fantastic car and it's a, such a fantastic shape if you just said the six seventy five LT then obviously that would have been a would pretty change. pretty easy decision. Um, I just think it's because it's more practical. Um, okay. I have a family. I've got three children, and I'm just trying to th- work out how I would live with a, a the 12C. If I if if you said to me which one would you choose based on looks, I mean it's pretty obvious. Yeah. If you said which one would you choose based on fun, again, the McLaren. Um, but I I, I think I just looked at it, sadly, as a practical. So it'd be interesting for me thinking about, <laughs> you know, we were chatting about value now. So if I was looking at that car, the M3 CSL has had a run and gone up and up. And some of the cars are 100K and 70K are probably get you a, a reasonable car, probably 45,000 miles, something like that. But very low mileage are over 100. But it'd be interesting, where does the 12C stop? So if is that the bottom or is it not? And I think that the reason the car is at that price is because of the warranty and the servicing. So if you look back at it, when I have McLaren, the service and warranty is really about 5,000 a year. So in my head, if you had five years ownership is 25,000. That M3, you could probably service every year, probably for three, 400 pounds, unless something went wrong. Um, And it's got very low overheads. Whereas the McLaren, I know on the article it said if the gearbox goes, it's is like thirty thousand. So you absolutely need that warranty. Whereas with the M3, you probably wouldn't get a warranty. Absolutely. I and mean, I, I had a Polo G40 supercharged. Um, it's quite a rare car when I was uh, in my twenties. So it's really based on a boy racer perspective. Um, <laughs> choosing. And I suppose that our era is that you know you're remembering that BMW I when do, it came yeah, out it's and part it was of my one, yeah. growing up. So. Um, and it's got an amazing engine on it. Yeah. yeah. But I would, I would be saying if I was looking at them cars myself, I saw a 12C up for 65. Where, where does it go it, it, for, does it go to 50,000 pounds? And then is it the bargain of the century? 
because you never have more performance. You've got those fantastic doors that go up on the car. Mm. It's McLaren built. The guys on here are doing these warranties now at 2,800 and servicing. And, you know, we read the article. He's got a lot of parts for these McLarens. So are they going to become... Also, it's the first McLaren road car. Yeah, I mean, the, so the, it the, should have a little bit of classic status at some point. I think it's the got value to. will go up. You think it will go up? I mm. think it will go up, and um, I think it uh, it's 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 iconic in the fact that it's the first real proper you know McLaren car yeah. that started everything off um, and started the evolution of the designs of the McLarens, um, especially the 650s and the. 675 LT sort of that's the next progression yeah. on, onwards from that I mean the problem is with McLaren is there's so many McLarens so if you've got such a huge range and there's so many cars it's forcing the value down I mean we know like 675 LTs are probably 170s and they were sort of 280s and that's probably held up as well as any we know that the mm. Senna's dropped off I mean I think it's prime time for McLaren because of the shortage of cars and I think that's really helped them stabilize the market. But if they can get their warranty program working and they're servicing at a good price, I'm sure these will shoot up, which is why I think, you know, if the guy's doing it at that level, it is a McLaren, but at £60,000, it looks a bit of a deal, doesn't it? Oh, incredible. I mean, it's it's a, it's a V8 turbocharged supercar. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if they went to 50, I think I would be in the market for one at that level I don't see what what you can get I mean if a new M3 is 90,000 uh, well a Golf R mm. it's 42,000 so you're almost in a McLaren and then you put the extras on it and it's more it's, it's, um, it's so the it's next more. bit I saw coming out was about biofuels now mm. I know that obviously the world's changing um, they're bringing out an E10 fuel yep. which is going to affect a lot of engines older engines and you can go on the website now put in your reg and find out about that um, but I think they will probably keep a super unleaded for high performance. And then this E10 is to save, obviously, on carbon emissions. It will save quite a lot. At the moment, we're at 95. So that would be like a 90 Ron um, fuel. But obviously, they are saying it is going to affect older engines um, on that. But again, I'm still hoping we do get some sort of biofuel. Otherwise, we're all going to be in an electric market, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's. Um, I think they. I think they mentioned something like six hundred six hundred thousand cars. Um, it'd be like taking six hundred thousand cars off the road That's by right. using this fuel. Um, I mean, we need it for machinery. Yeah, these type of. If that could be, because we're not going to be able to have electric diggers and dumper trucks, I assume. It's definitely interesting. I'm. I'm. I'm all for doing as much as we can for the environment. I think that's really important, and a part of me also. Obviously, it's a bit of a motorhead. Um, but it's just the noise and stuff, what's going to happen with electric cars. I mean, I, I quickly went on there because I wanted to check the V8 Vantage, and it's absolutely fine. Um, but what will we have as fuel is yeah. really the key. And I think if they can just keep making it, you know, more eco-friendly all the time, Porsche come in, um, and, and they've obviously bought into this uh, e-fuel, which starts... I think next year in Porsche race cars, mm -hmm. they're still building naturally aspirated GT3. So there must be something going on there. And, yeah. and how quick will that change be? So the next bit of news was we bought the DBR1. <laughs> and I think it looks absolutely <laughs> mega. I know you had a you know fantastic time out in that today, but should I tell you the story on that? Go on then. So what it, a couple of years ago, we went to Goodwood. And there was a stand there with one of these. And I said, oh, my God, that car, I, I have to have one of those. And I spoke with the guy and he said it was a long wait. But it was busy and it was, I think it was the Sunday and we were tired. You know, we'd been there for four days. And I went away and didn't do anything, just left it. And then there was a video on YouTube, Carfection, where Aston Martin have launched a DB59 edition Speedster, 850,000. Um, probably a bit more maybe with with extras and stuff um and it's a homage to the dbr1 so about two minutes into that video i rung asm <laughs> motorsport <laughs> because henry catchpole was sitting in one saying it's his favorite ever car 
but he wasn't allowed to drive it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the older car. And then he drove the newer one. I don't think he was overly impressed, but I think it's probably one of those cars. It's such an iconic shape. I don't know how you can replicate it. So he went out and drove the new one, but it was raining. There's a, and say within two minutes, I spoke to Andrew. He did have a car that I bought. And I thought, right, I'm just going to buy the car. He said it was the first time he's ever sold one over the phone. And I was probably the youngest owner he's ever had. So I was sort of really excited. But then I thought, did I make a big mistake? Did I, you know, so I paid, I think, 100,000 plus VAT for that car. And I went back through, studied it, looked at the market and saw, I think the last one went for $25 million as a, <laughs> as a race car, but there was only five, only five ever made. And it was never on the road. And I thought, well, what do I want to be in going forward? Would I rather be in something that looks the nuts, the sound, the drive? You can't go fast anymore. And as we spoke about in the car there are, you know, you're speed limited in cars from next year all new cars will have speed limiters but also you can't get the speed anyway but in that i can actually go through the gears you're going up to 60 mile an hour but i think for you being in it what did you feel about that's that open air I mean, it, yeah i mean it was, as we discussed when we were um we were driving along it, it's it's that overall experience that sensory overload the the things you you can smell what you can hear, what you can uh, feel, and and it's the ultimate experience. Because we were buzzing when we come back. Oh, yeah, the adrenaline. I mean, it was literally like uh, the best Alton Towers ride. Is that what it felt like? It for felt you? like yeah. that for me. Yeah. I mean, I do love rides. I have to. Admit. Right. I love G four. The, the feeling of the yeah, that G force. Um, I mean, obviously, we we didn't take it on a track to to really. Uh, I think it'd be get great it on a track, but I think it'd be yeah. fantastic. It's really agile. Yeah, it it's, is. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a straight six, isn't it? It's, um, they, they say it's more, more refined than a V six. Um, but it's just, it's just epic. That's all I can describe it as. I mean, it's got those beautiful spoke wheels. It reminds me of an E type Jag. Yeah. Um, my father had a Jag, um, that, uh, my godfather wrote off into a ditch and that <laughs> okay. thing, that would have been worth a hundred thousand by now, I think. Um, and I said about the switches being like a Spitfire. And yes. You said, you're, is that this weekend? Or uh, going, tomorrow. Tomorrow, My okay. father's going to fly a Spitfire. And uh, he was in the RAF uh, when he was young. And it was his dream. So uh, that's on his bucket list, as he says. <laughs> Where's the, where are you going tomorrow? Uh, Goodwood. Goodwood. Okay, so you're at mm. Goodwood. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, just going back to the car, it's just epic. I mean, when you, when you look at it, it's just so refined. The lines on it, the, the curvatures, the... It's just beautiful. I love this front grille. Yeah. It's like a face. It's stunning. Isn't it? Yeah, it's stunning. And just these seats where, you know, I think the cloth, 200 pound a meter for this horsehair and oh cotton. So this is as, you know, as it would have been back then. But some of the profiles of this car from the side are absolutely stunning. 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 And um, I, I've got a souvenir that I'm taking with me, um, which is. Uh, oh, off the, the, exhaust. the, off the exhaust. I did <laughs> say I thought that exhaust gets a bit hot. <laughs> But yeah, I do need to be careful with that with my daughter as well because I took Jenny out at the weekend and she yes. absolutely loved it. Couldn't stop smiling, mm. which is what you were getting that that yep. feeling from now. Yes. So this one's got a 4.2 straight six engine and it... And you see all those cylinders all nicely lined up. And we're saying about the chassis on there because it almost is a bit like a McLaren tub because you've got this mm. area here and then you step over that into it. Yeah, it's like that mm. atom, you know, the... Yeah, exactly. The, 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 the aero atom. Yeah. yeah. And it's like a space frame sort of chassis back mm. then. But I, I would, I'm mega impressed. I feel at high speed, it feels a little bit light, a little bit edgy. Um, <laughs> but so I part, think if you're keeping it as a yeah. nice speed, I think it, it, it's fantastic. And the looks you get and the appreciation. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's the sound as well. I mean, yeah, it just, sounds lovely. It sounds it? beautiful. I mean, it's, it's an Aston Martin at the end of the day. It's not going to sound awful, is it? It's not going to look awful. I mean, the, who, they, they design just epic cars. Well, I thought for me, where do where do I go with cars? Because obviously I had the rally cars. Yeah. I've had a lot of nice cars, but I've obviously sold off a lot of the newer stuff because it wasn't doing it for me. It didn't. And to be able to have a car at this level, which I don't think can look any better. It, it drives fantastic. You you know, I'm heel and toeing with you. I'm enjoying driving. I come back and I feel like I've gone for a drive. <laughs> You know, that, which is which is what I was missing from the modern stuff. And when I had like McLaren 600 LT, that you go out and you blast and you have a sensation of speed, but I would rather be on the simulator. Yes. Because I'm not 
you can't go quickly. You're just basically, you're, you're just restraining the whole time. So then it just becomes a normal car, but then you've got no interaction. Whereas with that, I'm using the clutch, I'm changing gear, I'm heel and toeing. You know, you're, you're absolutely enjoying it. Um, and I thought that with these, they would go up in value. And I don't know if I told you the story about collecting cars. So collecting cars, um, I put a deposit down and then one come up on collecting cars with 45,000 miles. And I thought, oh God, what's this going to go for? Because I know there's not many made. I think they only made about 22 of these tributes. So not many. There's only five of the originals. And I was watching it and it was 20,000. I thought, oh my God, say this sells for 25,000. I'm going to look like a right idiot here. <laughs> um, and I was watching it and uh, it went up and it went 40,000. I thought, okay, it went to 50,000. Um, and I, I spoke to someone in the industry and said, come on, what are these? He said, well, probably 65, 70. I said, yeah, but in the way we are now, and can you tell me a bit about the car? And he said, yeah, the guy absolutely loved it. He drove it all the way around south of France, England, Germany. He loved the car. I mean, 45,000 miles in that. Went up 60,000. Two more days to go, 65,000, 68. I thought, okay, 68. So I texted him, said it's going to be 68. 72 and okay 78 and now with that collecting cars it gets near the end of the auction you see it and i said oh it sold 78 it wasn't 78 because it takes time to go it ended up 92,000 45,000 miles so really now i've got a brand new one mm. for that um and yeah, I was, as I say, collecting cars for me has been a great website to get values of stuff as well. I do go on there a lot and search back the cars. I know it's an auction site, but some people are paying still quite a lot for them cars. But I, I saw it as something that it can also be electric. Very easy to do conversion on it. Oh, wow. um, the problem at the moment is the electric conversions are very expensive, but I think with batteries and that it will all come down in, in price. But that's super easy with that Jaguar because you know the E-types are electric and it's very, it's super easy to change that to electric. So it's trying to future-proof myself a bit as well. If we mm. were saying there is no fuel and you're not allowed a petrol car, yep. I can just change it to electric. I know it would cost money, but then you'd have an electric vehicle that's the most beautiful vehicle there is. I mean, I'm not sure how you could ever improve that shape. No, I think it's um, it's just epic. I mean, it's it's you're just fully immersed in the in the experience of driving it, and it's something which has character. It's like a little cartoon character, isn't it? Oh, and the story of the because I was watching lots of different videos on the car, obviously. The Le Mans win is so famous with Sterling, Sterling Moss, Moss being the hair. Yeah. He goes out, the Ferraris all then break and Carol Shelby comes through and takes the win. And that's yeah. why I had the number five. And then I managed to get the number plate for like 120 pounds, but it's fantastic plate, isn't it? With the M059 DBR, it looks absolutely fantastic on there. So we've got, so working from this, we're going to go to Goodwood this year and mm -hmm. we're going to have that on a stand but yes. it's been absolutely an awesome event for us we got a huge marquee this year um, biggest we've ever done and we you know we can't wait to get customers and obviously yourself are coming down I know yeah, I Dean's wait. coming down can't wait but when you go in the paddock there with the old cars the sensation of the fuel the, is just immense absolutely immense and I've got a story about that as well when I was there two years ago a guy come in about his phones and I was chatting with him and he had a flat cap on and, and he said, Richard, I've got lots of problems with signal at my home with a phone. I said, okay. And I chatted with him for about half an hour and he said, I don't know why you've done that. I've only got one phone. I said, oh, it doesn't matter. I, you know, he said, because you've done that, um, I'm in pole position for the race and I'm driving a five million pound. I think it was a, a Cobra. Um, and I was like, right. Okay. He said, meet me one o'clock so i've got the stand i've had to say to everyone sorry i've got to go up i thought this is a joke it's not gonna went over there richard come through i was with him with the mechanics went through no one else there then i'm with the presenters then he said come over let me show you the car and uh, tell you what i'm gonna do before the race i'm like this is this is incredible and then we're with the presenters in the back just and he's over in the corner and the mechanic goes is richard there is richard there so oh my god and I, I walked over 
He said, this is what I need to do on the car, get it ready. This is what I'm going to do first lap and went out. And I think he ended up, because the racing driver swaps over with the owner and I think he ended up third in the race. And then they, they rung me, said, we're in the champagne bar car. And I couldn't because I had to get everything <laughs> packed <laughs> down it. from the market. I know, but, but it just showed like in business sometimes, you never know yep. who you're talking to. Yep. And I just gave, you know, the same attention as would anyone, whether he's got one phone or a thousand. And then he was like, I'm on pole position. Come Brilliant. in, VIP ticket. But I think it's an incredible event. And I mean, hopefully this year with, you know, with everything we've had with COVID, it will run fine and it'll be another spectacular thing. But we're bringing the DBR and we're going to bring that Challenge the Road Vantage, oh, which we're going to show you a bit later how fantastic. I'm doing. But it is really coming along. And a well, huge challenge with Dean, it. isn't it? I mean, I, I think he's not quite sure <laughs> I can do it, but I, I think I can and I am getting closer and I can't wait to show him. So... That's the DVR. That's some news. Goodwood. I'm telling everyone about these Sims. You're the first guest. First guest to go on it. Started with the sort of Formula Junior car. What did you think? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not an experienced simulator uh, driver. I have to say, <laughs> which showed in my lap time compared to yours. And, uh, I, I'm yet to have another go. I'm, I've got an addictive personality, so I'm going to have to well, keep... Well, we have got your lap time, to, but I know you want to do yeah, You want to do another one because yeah. there could be a lot of drivers watching this you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, What's well, the you, feeling, though, from driving? Because you started off in in that Ford junior. Ford. So what the mm. motion, the steering, how close? And I, I couldn't get you off it, could I? Because no. it, it immerses you. and you, It does, yeah. I mean, when you, when, when you switch it to the F1 car, wow. I mean, I've never seen you. You laughed out loud I did on laugh. the first I mean, acceleration. It's just <laughs> overwhelming. Uh, it's amazing how quick you get used to it, and then you start concentrating a bit more. You get a bit more serious, and it just it just feels just out of this world. I mean, it's so fast. Well, I've never so seen quick. you. Just were laughing out loud. You're just smiling. It just oh, it's brilliant. I, I mean, I love it. I mean, I could spend all day on it just trying to get a better lap time. I mean, I think that's something I'm going to have to do now. It's um so we saw from the last lockdown, obviously we had the first lockdown, then I went with Dean and said we I need to buy something to be able to drive. Yeah. Let's have a look. I'm gonna go and have a look at simulators. So went to the simulator place at Brands Hatch, went on the first ones with no direct drive and no motion and thought I almost went. Um because I just couldn't drive the car, it was just going off. And then <laughs> Uh, Dan at race room said to me, look, Richard, just, just wait, go on one with direct drive and motion. I tell you, it'd be totally different. And I yep. went on it and I went an F1 car at Spa and I, well, I bought it that day, even though I didn't have one for sale. I bought the one in the showroom because I said, you're not gonna have many people coming in because we're going to have another lockdown. Can I have this one? And <laughs> so we ended up doing a deal on that one. And then I got a call from, from Dean going, you know, I've bought a PlayStation. He has. <laughs> I said, I didn't know what to say because really, I've just bought, I said, well, I just got a full motion sim. And he went, ah, oh, you've just ruined my day. I paid £90 for a PlayStation and now you've got and bought a full simulator. And he, he almost put down the phone. But then I said to him, you've got to try it. You've got to, how can it be that good? And we went up there and he loved it. And now he's racing like all the time. Mm, it is, he it's is, addictive though, isn't it? It's, well, he's got um, a Gran Turismo set up with a direct drive. Um, I'm not sure the motion at the back is nice, but I think if you're driving a lot, I mean, he's doing four hour races. Yeah. You know, wow. you, if you're on that, that screen. Yeah. So if you're just using the steering wheel on that and the direct drive is, is fantastic. But I just saw that where are we going to go if we can't have petrol and we're limited on our speed and we can't really do anything. And basically they want the cars to drive themselves. That's, that's where we're going to get to. And I am absolutely loving that. I mean, I would go on it virtually every day. So what I was trying to say to Dean was, you know, there isn't, if you said to me, sell all the cars and the sim, and I would keep the sim over the cars. Yes. Any day of the week. Because I can go on any track. I mean, you just had the F1 race. I was in that F1 car on that track going round it because I wanted to have to know before the race what they're going through and what they, and it was really, really interesting. And you think for the money, you can put these on a monthly payment 
and you're getting for, I mean, say you started with, I don't know, an 8,000 SIM, or whatever you wanted to start at, you've got a fantastic setup. I mean, you can go lower than that, you can go 2,000 pounds. But you would have as good a performance without GeForce as you could have. Well, I know for you on there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's um, it's a, it's just great fun, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's exhilarating. I mean, yeah, I, I come off sweating and adrenaline. I'm like, yeah. yeah, I was sweating. Yeah, yeah I know. Anyway. I think I was more nervous about my time. To be honest, yeah. um, I wasn't obviously experiencing uh, what my drivers. Uh, Would it through. help you anything with the drivers <laughs> though? Or, or yeah, I mean, it, it it helps me appreciate. You know. Okay. Yeah, because um, you were at brands. Last weekend, I was at Brands last weekend supporting a driver in uh, British. And Formula, how did he Formula do 4. in that? He... he did really well actually. Yeah, he okay. missed out on a podium in race two, uh, literally by a wing length, the right. front wing length. Um, so, so uh, a little bit gutting about that, but um, but he drove really well, and um, he's learning. So he's a rookie um, in his first year. So, uh, so uh, good job. And it's it it just I think I think when you get to experience just a simulator, although it's not the real thing on track. Uh, it still gives you that appreciation of what these guys actually go through and do. I mean, driving an F1 car on a Brands Hatch circuit is pretty tough, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they banned them um, there, didn't they? Yeah, yeah exactly. Because, they're, they're I mean, just, you struggled too, a bit with that. Too quick. Yeah, they're too, too quick. quick. Um, and you can't, you, there's only one, there's only one place on the track you can really get up to, yeah, or maybe speed. two, uh, to, up to speed um, into that seventh gear. And then you have to right, drop drop down a few gears to get through that through that so uh, just a chicane. question for you on on f1 then so you've you've been around a lot of these drivers. who impressed you the most you've been around <laughs> everyone always asks me that question yeah, okay. um it's very unfair or is it in different no but is it in different <laughs> areas like would it be focus if you see like lewis now you would would lewis for a uh, few lewis years? is the ultimate isn't he the, in, but in why would of... that be compared to the others what would you say the standout quality is is it determination is it i mean lewis is ex- Lewis, um, let's talk about Lewis, is extremely competitive um, individual. Um, I think athletes at the top of their game and are, obviously, yeah. have to be. And they all are. They're all incredible drivers. Yeah. Uh, I think Lewis just has the attributes that are required to reach that ultimate level. He's able to optimize his his overall abilities. I think when it comes to drivers, they have this incredible ability to focus for a long period of time. And that's something that which they start to build up and progress from a young age. So in karting, they call karting the sort of grassroots um, where you learn your race craft. And if you speak to any F1 driver, they'll tell you, you know, that's ultimately the best experience they ever had in their life is that they always talk well, about karting. Well, karting is so much fun, isn't it? It's so much fun. Yeah. And and I'm looking after, uh, I support a carter in KZ2. Okay. So those carts are do over 100 miles an hour. Uh, extremely physical. And we've been working on his uh, training and preparation for the past year. And he's made uh, considerable gains um, with that. And the funny thing is, when you work with these guys and you improve their actual fitness, um, shall we shall we call it, or physical performance, the, the first thing they say is they're able to concentrate for longer. So they have the endurance capacity to go longer, which then the physical or mental side um, sort of, you know, gel. So what about Alonso? He Fernando. Would been, he would have been there when you were there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because you'd understand. Again, bit, but just as What incredible. do you think of his photo? Is, is it just that incredible. level of focus? Incredible. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. Um, he's an extremely intelligent person. Extremely intelligent driver. Very anal- analytical. And he's back in F1 now and doing back pretty well. F1. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah. He, he, he has this incredible ability to adapt to anything, any setup. Um, he he just seems to be able to know how to get to maximize the car, um, and you know it's, I think some of the drivers that impressed me has has been you know George Russell and Lando. How do you Lando think that's going to go next year then? Because if he's going to go to Mercedes, which looks likely, that's really going to give Lewis a real shake up, isn't it? Because I think George is fast and good racecraft. So that might be good for Lewis rather than having a teammate who can't, you know, he was performing well, Bottas, but lately he's been off the mark compared to Lewis, hasn't he? So George Russell, I think I met him when he was 12 and uh, at McLaren. It's really nice gentleman. Very nice, very nice uh, young man. Uh, very, very tall, focused. isn't he? He's for tall. Yeah. 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 Alex Alban, tall. Yeah. Um, Jensen, the, you know, the, the, the taller drivers. Um, but yeah, George is is extremely impressive. I mean, he showed what he was capable of in when he uh, replaced. Um, What's your feeling on him then? 
So if he goes into Mercedes, do you think he will compete time-wise with Lewis straight away? Oh, it's hard to say, isn't it? I mean, with the rule changes next year. he's done that one year. race, didn't he? And he should have won. Yeah, I mean, there's so many so, rule changes um, for next year that um, it's going to be interesting to see how the cars perform and yeah. how the how the teams perform overall. So I think um, it's going to be exciting for sure. Uh, I think the last two seasons, despite the um, difficulties that we've all experienced, it's actually been some of the most exciting um, F1 races, uh, I think, for many, yeah. many years. Um, so it's been brilliant. Yeah, and I think the cars now are just so fast as well, aren't they? I mean, so quick. I mean, they're pulling um, with the, with the amount of downforce uh, they generate now. Uh, you're talking six G under braking, which is equivalent to thirty nine kilos of force against the head. Um, so that's the equivalent of a ten twelve year old child. Uh, so that's that's how much weight or thirty nine bags of sugar um, as as a, as a load against the head and neck. The neck has to then uh, uh, keep the keep the head um, or the eyes level with the horizon. And the shoulders basically help to stabilize and support the neck. And the neck has to endure the uh, the forces um, to keep the head, which weighs five kilos, 8% of your body weight. And the helmet weighs 1.5 or thereabouts. So you're right, talking okay. six and a half kilos times that. So um, how often would a force. racing driver, they would use simulators quite a bit, wouldn't they? Yeah, they, 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 a lot. they use the simulators um, to help the, the teams, the engineers to uh, develop the car ultimately yeah so that's the main i suppose because testing was banned in the end wasn't it so they use it yeah back when i started so i i started mclaren in 2006 and back then uh there was race test race test race mm. test race test and when i was looking after cova line in 2008 um we were i was i, I did so many tests I, I did 59 flights that year did you yeah 59 flights uh so a lot of traveling and i was doing most of the tests um, supporting the drivers, so uh, supporting Lewis and ha and and Hakey at, at, at the tests, and Gary Paffitt and uh, Oliver Turby, sort of um, joining around that time, and Pedro De La Rosa, um, I was his coach, uh, performance coach. So you think a, a lot of them are going to need to know your lap time then, aren't they? To get um, embarrassingly. <laughs> so did you want to have another go yes. and do it? <laughs> yes. So your time. Oh gosh. Was one. Oh dear. Twenty seven. Oh no. Dot three six six, but you want to have another go, even though you've already done fifty laps. Yes, more than anyone, more than me. <laughs> so that, so you're top of the leaderboard because, well, you're first. Yeah, <laughs> so benchmark. But we 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 let you have one more go then on the time. Okay, thank you. But how I feel these simulators are only going to get better and better. I mean, that's mm. got a, a KW setup. KW have got a car that's in-house two million pound that they do all the suspension for their cars on so they're not even really going on the road now to do suspension and that setup so i feel these simulators could be absolutely incredible i mean i think yeah. that is pretty incredible because there's only so much you can probably want to do at home before you would feel maybe ill or so tired yeah absolutely uh, it's it's if um if we're forced into a position then we tend to make things better yeah so techno technology sort of improves exponentially when we're put in situations where we need it to be mm. uh so especially don't you feel that's the same though with the you know we spoke about e-fuels mm -hmm. but i feel that we will find a way hydrogen there'll be some way of having a car that's carbon neutral yeah absolutely I hope so. and we've got time yeah. we've got time yeah and then that would really help you know us to keep all them cars keep that level of noise as well Yes, because it is, 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 that, that, is it's that sensory overload um, that uh, exciting all your senses. So what you can see, what you can hear, what you can smell, what you can feel. Mm -hmm. If you've got all of your senses being excited at the same time, you get a better engagement into yeah. what you're doing. As soon as you remove any of those senses, you're less engaged. Yeah. So I think it's so important that we find ways to keep fully engaged in what we're doing. Um, a bit like you mentioned about being in nature, you know, taking the car out. Yeah. You're in nature as well as driving a car. Well, you do a lot with the, the Get Active program, don't you, on mm. being outside, walking. Absolutely. Um, and obviously for all my staff, you monitor all their break times and make sure they go outside. And I, I, it's been very beneficial for myself and that. And I've done more walking than ever and going out. And it just refreshes you, doesn't it? It's even like we said, you go out in that car, you feel refreshed, you come back, you go again, rather than 
sitting like we are for long periods of time at a computer um, and it's just not good for you no absolutely i mean the most important thing is if you are seated for long periods um working that you take um, breaks on a re- you know very regular basis um to move so you're always I think you moving said, from one position. every sort of 20 minutes uh, yeah uh, every 20 minutes is a cue for you to actually make sure you move from one position but you right, should be okay, moving yeah. all the time you know right, sort of okay. just shuffling around a little bit um, getting up and down, uh, going to get a cup of coffee. And stand-up desks. I know we've initiated at the office a lot more. Stand-up well. desks yeah. as well. But you don't, yeah. again, you don't want to be standing for long periods. Yeah. So you want to be a bit of sitting, a bit of standing, a bit of moving around, a bit of shuffling. Uh, popping, keeping hydrated is obviously extremely important with water. Um, and then secondary fluids after that. Uh, also, you can concentrate like a racing driver, you know, sat down as they are in, in sort of various positions from being upright to reclined is that the, you, if you want to concentrate, you have to look after your well-being and your body. I mean, you have to eat the right foods um, so you can maintain your energy levels and concentration. Your cognitive performance is, 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 um, is high and optimized like a driver. You optimize your posture and your, your physical performance. Um, and then that has a correlation then with your mental performance. So if we can teach people how to become healthier and improve their well-being, then ultimately their work productivity will be maximized. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I know my staff have absolutely benefited from from the program you created for them. And this made a massive difference, massive difference to myself. So, yeah, so that's the end of the first podcast. You're the first guest. You've set a time. You're going to set another time. We're going to have a laugh on that, aren't we? Absolutely. But, um, yeah, it's been great to have you today. Thank and, you so and much. I've, I've enjoyed it so much and I look forward to the next show. So do I. Thank you for thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Simon. Thank See you. you soon. Bye bye.